going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Hurt Business Podcast. Today's a special one. Josh and I are joined by the Cage Titans' new lightweight champion of the world, Mr. Jojo Gianetti. What's going on, guys? How we doing, Joe? I'm doing good. Feeling real good. Yeah, I see now on your story, you just you just made that commute back here to, to MA from San Jose, is it? Yeah, so actually my bus broke down halfway home on the way to the fight, so I actually left it at a shop in Nebraska. Oh. So I just made a trip from Nebraska back to Massachusetts, and I was going to take my time, but I just said screw it and did it in 24 hours straight shot. Jeez, how many <laughs> miles is that from Nebraska? I think it was 1,500. <sighs> wow. Jeez. And when, <laughs> it's just you driving? You had no no help? No, nah, my dogs weren't with me because I already brought them home. My girl had work, so I just flew out. One of my buddies lives out there. He drove me to pick it up, and then I just straight shot at home. Jeez, man, jeez. That's probably that fighter's mentality, just, just sticking through it, huh? Pretty much. I did 12 hours, and then I was going to sleep, and I was like, oh, I just did 12. What's another 12? So I grabbed some coffee and just kept it moving. Yeah, and some donkeys. Yeah, exactly. They don't have any in the Midwest. Terrible. Uh, yeah, it's only a matter of time. We should we should advocate for some some donkeys out there. I'm in. I need it, especially when I'm training in California. I'm all Starbucks when I'm at AKA. <laughs> yeah, donkeys is an East thing. People that right? listen to that like don't know that. <laughs> coffee at starbucks i can't do five bucks a day <laughs> yeah i don't know and here at donkeys are like on every block you you go down this yeah, street you pass like five <laughs> you pass like five joe my question to start us off is talk about your truck i seen uh on the cage titans i think you took over their uh their story and you gave a nice little tour of of your bus and all the uh things you added to it and made it a home field just kind of talk about it and that whole process if you don't mind so uh, as everybody knows, California is one of the most expensive states out there, um, along with Massachusetts. And I could barely afford living in Massachusetts, but I got to go to AK and train. It's where the best training camp is for me. Um, but I just couldn't afford to fly out, rent a place, rent a car, and then have somebody at home take care of my dogs. So, you know, for the last few years, I've been telling everybody I want to get an RV or I want to get a van or a bus and convert it so that I can take my animals with me and have a place to stay and a car all in one. Um, and it did take a while and I eventually was able to get the money together. I bought a bus, uh, I stripped the inside, I power washed the inside, and then we put a bed in there, a shower, sink, a stove, um, some storage space, and we, we made it a little, little home. And I was able to drive across country and just live in the AKA parking lot, train every day. Sweet. That's awesome. And when you say it's a it's a bus, is it like a, a sprinter? Is it like a little school bus? Like what are we talking here? It's a it's a short bus. So it was a, it was nice. a short yellow bus. It was from um, one of the Franklin Elementary School systems. I got it from this this dealer that actually just sells and buys buses from schools. So they had a whole lot full. And uh, I just showed up. I tested them all out, and I was like, for the price, this one's perfect. I'll take it. Sweet. Yeah, that's a home. lucky pickup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. They had a couple in there. And then uh, I found the one I wanted and I was going to try and haggle them on the price. And then as soon as I started to, this couple walked in and was like, oh, we're here to look at the short bus. I was like, here, take the money. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to go into a bidding war with the, with the couple here. <laughs> yeah, they looked like they had a little bit more, more money than I did. So I was like, here, cash, just take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. But um, yeah, I guess we kind of go into... Uh, the actual questions man so just tell us my well my first question for you I guess like man just tell us like what made you fall in love with mixed martial arts like what what is it that you love about it and like how did you get into this um that's like such a there's so many answers to that that all lead to where I'm at um but it's actually funny like I'm sure like if you've watched tough like you saw my whole thing you know I got yep. picked on when I was a kid I got in a lot of fights even before I knew I wanted to be a fighter. Um, and then I think I was in like third grade. And to this day, I still don't know. I got I to gotta do a time check. I don't know if it was live or a rerun, but my friend at the time's dad was watching Anderson Silva versus Forrest Griffin. Mm. And the, the things that Silva did to Forrest Griffin, I was like, this isn't a fight. Like he's, his hands are down. He's, you know, he's bent over all this stuff. Right. everything you shouldn't do in a fight and he's just picking them apart and like i fell in love with that i was like that's what i want to do like when i fight somebody 
I want people to say, look, he's doing everything wrong. And then just finish someone <laughs> and have them be like, uh, I guess not. Uh, so like I fell in love with the sport from there. I started watching it. I used to actually go over my friend's house just to watch the fights. And like, he would sit there and not be interested in me and his dad would be hyped. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, as I grew up, I still got picked on. I got into a bunch more fights and then I was in high school, I think my sophomore junior year. And you know, the teachers all ask you that same question, like, well, what do you want to do after high school? And I was in school for automotive mechanics. So I was learning how to do that, but I get like really anxious about working on other people's cars. Cause I don't want to break their shit. And so I was sitting there and I was like, I mean, I've never really lost a street fight. I think I could be a pro fighter. And she was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know about that <laughs> yeah she kind of just like and she was a super cool teacher like she kind of told you how it is and she was like i can't imagine you getting into a fight and i was like well you should have seen me last week i was like the kid that met me outside the school <laughs> that's so interesting though because it, it seems like most most guys are kind of like when they first start out they're sort of like all right so i'm kind of good at street fighting i haven't learned so maybe i should like do it professionally and that's really cool how like you've come from that background where it's like, oh, I'm actually good at this and I actually enjoy the sport. So maybe I should, you know, do it as a job. And it's yeah, cool that you sure. can even do it as a job, right? <laughs> exactly. And like, I also try to keep that mentality, you know, because there's always those guys like, oh, well, I, I whoop that guy's ass in the street. Right. I even have people that tell me like, oh, well, you would whoop my ass in a cage. But like if we went outside and I'm like, yeah, I'd stomp your head in. And they're like, what? And I'm like, you don't realize <laughs> like. I'm not, I'm not Jorge Masvidal or, or friggin' Kimbo Slice, but I was fighting in the streets since I was in elementary school. Like, mm -hmm. I don't mean like we were get gangs together to sit around and fight, but like I was getting picked on. I was fighting on blacktops. I was fighting in the concrete on the sidewalk in the woods. Like, yep. so when guys say that stuff, you know, like your buddy's drunk buddy is like, oh, if we went outside, I say every time I was like, I would kill you. Mm -hmm. I would go to prison. <laughs> I was like, I'm a trained fighter for one. And I fought before I even knew how to fight for two. And then, you know, guys kind of get that, that, they give you that look like, oh, and I'm like, I'm not mad at you for it. I'm just letting you know that I came from where you're at. I used to be the untrained guy that would just throw as hard as he could in a street fight. And, mm -hmm. and now I got the skill to back it up. And I think people resonate with that a little bit more when they're like, oh, this dude was fighting since before he knew what the hell he was doing. Right. Yeah, literally. And uh, just when we speak about fighting, of course, there's a lot of athletics that go into it. So before fighting, was there other sports that you played or was it, has it always been uh, just like so a defense I, mechanism? I played every sport and I sucked at all of them. Okay. The only sport that I was actually decent at was baseball. Um, I was a decent pitcher, but just like my fighting, I can't do anything textbook. So I actually pitched sidearm mm. and I absolutely destroyed my elbow by the time I was 12. And I was just like, I can't do this anymore. Like I would pitch, I would pitch like a little league game and then ice my arm for four days. Wow. And I was just like, yeah, my elbow was absolute junk. I was like, yeah, I, I just don't want to do this. And then I got older and I realized how much money baseball players got. And I was like, oh, I messed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's actually insane the amount of revenue they generate. I played baseball too. I was second base. Also not very good at it, but... <laughs> Oh, it was yeah. crazy. Like I see some of these contracts, like, oh, we got a one year extension for 27 million. I'm like, for a year? <laughs> like, yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, fighters don't see those types of dollar signs. Oh my God. If I could go back and, and pitch and not absolutely lose my arm, I probably would. Maybe learn how to fight <laughs> on the side, but to get those contracts, I'll take a little bit of elbow pain. <laughs> yeah. You never know when you'd have to charge the mound, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, Joe, money man ladies and gentlemen <laughs> <laughs> just another question that because you uh mentioned whenever like you have drunk friends who who kind of test that limit of of you know saying that they could beat you up and all these different things has there ever been a guy or somebody that actually tried and did something and you showed him the worst day of his life so thankfully knock on wood not yet um, but it's funny you bring that up. Actually, last week, I went out with a couple of my buddies just to celebrate the fights. You know, I don't go out much. And we were at um, we were at the casino in Boston. And this guy comes walking up to us, stumbling. He's got his own bottle of Hennessy. He's outside the club. He brought a bottle. And he, like, looks in my ears. He's like, oh, you fight, da, 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 da. And, you know, I'm giving him the whole spiel. I'm like, yeah, I just fought. And he's like, you know, I know, I know a thing or two about fighting. And I was like, cool, man, that's awesome. And then he's like, he's like, I think that, like, you know, 
we could go outside and box it up. And I was like, how much are you going to pay me? And he was like, what? And I was like, I don't fight for free. And he's like, well, I ain't got money like that. And he pretended to throw a jab at me. And like, it got pretty close and I kind of pulled my head back. And I, I think it wouldn't have hit me hard, but it definitely would have like tapped my nose. I like pulled my head back and I just laughed it off. But in my head, I was like, if this guy throws another one, am I going to have to drop him in the middle of a casino? Yeah. <laughs> like, but then he but then he laughed it up and was like, oh, you want some of this Henny? And I was like, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> like that, I, From what I've seen, I don't drink Hennessy, but that's like the, the number one thing to start a fight. You start drinking Hennessy, you're probably fighting by the end of the night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Hennessy does have that effect on people, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, a I'm a tequila guy. It just puts me, tequila and it puts me to sleep. I'm, I'm shit faced a couple shots in and then I'm in bed. <laughs> it is back to training. <laughs> yeah, next morning I'm sweating freaking Jose Cuervo at the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's a good, I guess that's a good segue to my next question. Um, so like tell us a little bit about like what's your normal training schedule like outside of like a fight camp? So like say you don't have a fight coming up anytime soon. So what is that training schedule like and um, I guess you can tell us like what was the training schedule like leading up to your most recent victory as well. So it's I have such a weird schedule when I'm not in fight camp, especially when I'm not in California. Um, it's very spontaneous, but as long as I'm getting the work that I want in, I'm happy. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of when that's going to be. So I, you know, I work overnights. I sometimes work mornings, and you know, we clean hood systems for restaurants. So that mm -hmm. schedule depends on the restaurant. It changes every week, every day. Um, you know, in a perfect world, I wake up in the morning, I get a lift in, um, some light cardio, like a jog or something. And then I mm -hmm. rest during the day. And then at night, I'm either wrestling, grappling, kickboxing. And then I go mm -hmm. to work for the night. Um, what normally happens nine out of 10 is I work until about five in the morning. I sleep until noon. And then I'll lift, do a little bit of cardio, and then I'll eat lunch and then I'll go train again. And then I'll go back to work for the overnight. Um, sometimes I work midday and I'll, I'll train in the morning and then I'll come home like a couple of times last, I say fight camp, but before I even left for my camp, I was getting my lifts in at like two in the morning, like 1130 at night. Like I would just go out in my garage and start deadlifting. My girlfriend would come out and be like, you know, you're slamming those weights kind of loud. We can hear you in the house. I was like, just put some headphones on. I got to get this done. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get to work. Um, but as long as I get my lifts in and then I get some technique in, I'm pretty happy for the day. It's a lot more organized when I'm in California and I'm, you know, I'm in the parking lot and I'm just in the gym pretty much all day. Um, but if I get my work in, I'm happy. Nice. So it's like it's very spontaneous for you, pretty much. Yeah, for sure. And luckily, you know, I have friends at the gym that, you know, my buddy Tyler, I can call him up like, hey man, I'm gonna be working till like nine o'clock. Would you mind coming by my house afterwards? We'll hit pads at eleven o'clock at night. Or even better, if he's not working the next day, I'd be like, hey, you want to come over at 8 a.m., hit some pads before I got to go to work? So, you know, I've got I've got teammates and friends that will help me out and kind of work around my schedule, just like I said, just to get that work in. I, me, personally, fighting is my career, so I don't care what time I got to do it as long mm -hmm. as I can get it in. Right. Yeah, yeah I guess that's what, that's what matters anyways, is just getting the work in. It doesn't matter, like, when and what time you do it. There's some guys we've talked to that are, that are – uh, are doing it the same like very similar to how you do it they're very spontaneous with it so that's that's interesting um to see how uh to see those two perspectives you know yeah i for sure like it when it's more organized it's just it's easier mm -hmm. for me to plan my day um but like i said i gotta do what i gotta do so if i'm <laughs> if i'm running and lifting at 6 a.m and then doing pads at midnight i'm happy good with, good with me yeah that's yeah. awesome, dude. That's awesome. And you still find time to uh to stream, huh? Always. I, I need that like <laughs> mental break of just like shoot some shit or like play some freaking Zelda. I need yeah. some type of mental break. Yeah, I feel that, man. Get your mind off the fight game and, and, and all the stresses that it brings. Um 100%. It's 24-7. People don't realize. Like, you go home. Like, when you get an opponent and you train your ass off all day, you're like, wow, I feel real good. Then you go home and you're sitting there like, this guy's going to try and kick my ass. And you're still just thinking about that fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody's out there training to get you, to take your head off. Yeah. Uh, but staying in this this training topic, I want to uh, ask you a few questions about training at a place like AKA, having all those like world-class athletes around you, highly regarded coaches, Javier Mendez himself. I noticed he, uh, he commented on one of your post-fight posts, which was super cool. Uh, so just speak of like what sort of advantages working out at a place like AKA 
adds to your game? Uh, first, I want to say, you guys have no idea how much that comment from Hovman on my post, <laughs> because he harps me so much in training. Like, he, he is such a good coach. He does not sugarcoat it. Like, he'll watch me spar three rounds, and, and I'll come out, and, you know, Tomas, um, who's, who's running kickboxing, be like, Joe, you're doing really good. Uh, you know, I know you're frustrated, but, you know, I'll be going with this kid, Mo. He's like, Mo's just one of our better guys right now. Like, I know you feel like you suck, but you're doing good. And then I look over at Hav and he's like, yeah, your wrestling was kind of dog shit. You need to work with DC a lot more. And I'm like, yeah, coach. I'm like, you're not wrong, but like just a pat on the back would be nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tough love. <laughs> yeah, 100 percent. So then, you know, I'm scrolling through Instagram and I see that comment. And I was like, yes, I was like, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> That's dope. Yeah, man, I definitely caught it caught my eye 100 percent when I when I seen it. Um but what kind of things did 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 working out at a gym like AKA add to to what we see uh, at August twenty eighth? Ah, uh, it just raised the bar, man. You know, uh, I've been at AKA a few times now. I think that was my fourth camp out there, fifth, something like that. Um, but this was just the best one by far. And I've said it before, in my previous camps, it was tough. You know, living with you know three other fighters where only two of us had a car, and now having my own car my training was on my schedule. You know, I lived in the parking lot, so I'd wake up, train, and then I'm back in the bus. And then later that night, I'm either back at AKA or I'm just driving over to the, the weightlifting gym down the street and getting a heavy lift in. And it was great having that schedule, getting extra training in, you know, sometimes three times a day. And that's before we even get into who I'm training with, you know, then you get into the training and the first three weeks I was in there with Habib and his crew with, with Islam and, and all those guys, and, you know, they're just tearing me apart. They're just dogging me and just seeing that. And there were certain things that I was doing that, you know, I was doing pretty good against them in certain aspects. And whether they were letting me or I was actually doing good, it helped my confidence. I was like, oh, when I get in the fight, it's not going to be against these guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, Deron Wynn was helping me out with my wrestling. That's my boy. And then, you know, I went down to DC's Wrestling Academy, and he was helping me out. And then his high school kids were kicking my ass. Um, and even then I'm wrestling these high school kids and I'm going, I'm not going to fight anybody anytime soon. That's nearly as good as these kids are wrestling. <laughs> yeah. These are like real breaded wrestlers that, that DC probably had to go against. Yeah. I was watching kids that were like as tall as my knees, like, you know, lat dropping each other, suplexing each other, hitting double legs. And I was like, I can, I can't even walk in a straight line right now. And these kids are throwing each other. <laughs> Just walking around ice picking each other <laughs> oh my god it was crazy like i was practicing and i kept stopping to watch these kids and i was like shit and Duran goes you're mad they're better than you aren't you and i was like <laughs> yeah they're so much better than me <laughs> yeah that wrestling is, is something else isn't it it's it's unreal well, the good thing about going up against guys in the normaga medoff camp is it really doesn't get better than than a lot of those guys like in the world uh, so I can definitely see how that adds to your confidence. Yeah, hundred percent. And then, you know, I'm going with guys that are tearing it up in Bellator. I'm going with Kyle Crutchmer. Um, I was going with Mo Locke. He just wanted uh, UAE warriors and the list goes on and on. Like before I was, I'm, I'm a shy person. So like, I kind of had a little circle of guys I was training with, and, you know, the more and more I'm kind of branching out and I got all these guys at AKA, uh, literally everybody in that room is just so much better than me. And they're also, you know, just helping me out. They're not just whooping my ass. So like, Hey, do this instead of this. It was just, it was a fantastic camp and they're only going to get better. And I'm only going to get better. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm excited for it. Awesome. Yeah. That kind of goes into the next question. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, your most recent fight and um, which was versus Darius Estelle. So I guess the question to ask is, do you, did you prepare like for this opponent specifically, or was it just like a fight that was like, all right, I have to kind of just go in there and do my thing and, you know, see what happens while I'm in there. Like how, how, what is that process for you? Like leading up to the. So normally I am, my training and everything is so focused around my opponent. Like he's going to do this. So I got to do that mm -hmm. and so forth and so forth. Um, but I went out to AKA before I even had an opponent. And when I went out there, they were like, okay, who's your opponent? What's his style? Like, what are we preparing for? And I told them, no opponent. I lost my last two fights. I suck at a lot of things. I need to fix them all. And I need to get better at the things I'm already good at. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. Ended up being for 
six out of the seven weeks there, we just focused on getting me better. I didn't focus on what he was going to do, or what I had to stop. It was just get better, improve, improve, improve. And I did that. Um, and I've said it a million times. I think that's where a lot of guys start to fall off, whether before the UFC, after the UFC, or in the UFC. Guys get so good and then stop getting better. And I'm just focused on getting better every single day. And I did that while I was out there. It's not easy to do. You know, sometimes you hit walls. But yeah. I felt better every single day of training. And then the last week there, I really, you know, I didn't watch any tape on him until the last week out there. I watched mm -hmm. some tape, focused a little bit more on what I was actually going to do in the fight. And then when I got home, it was just burning calories for the weight cut. And every night I was watching more and more tape, um, mm -hmm. kind of like a cram session in school. And <laughs> I, I had those tapes fresh in my mind come fight night. And I didn't really focus on what he was going to do on fight night. I focused on all the things I got better at. And I was like, okay, let's just do this. No, that's super important. Um... Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, because I, I was looking at the fight, and you definitely looked like the more composed fighter. He was sort of bringing the pressure on you early in the rounds, and then he sort of like tire out. And yeah, so that's kind of like how the fight went. But you know, I have to say, as a as a degenerate man, I I, always, I like to look at the stats and what people were thinking. Nobody had you knocking this guy out, man. It was Never. very Never. low, man. I love looking at that stuff because it, it's sort of like I'm, I, I sort of like look at these things and I'm like, damn, he proved them wrong. So to see you knock him out, that, that must have felt really nice. It felt great. Um, and it's funny because I told a bunch of people I'm either going to dominate him for five rounds or I'm going to knock him out. And, mm -hmm. you know, even my buddies are like, yeah, yeah, sure you are. And I was like, dude, listen, just stylistically, he's just going to be running his face into everything I throw. Um, and That's I was trying went. and yeah, and it's how it went. And I was trying to tell myself, like when I was watching tape the night before Wayne's after I cut some of the weight, I felt after watching his fight so confident in the striking difference technique wise and even power wise. But I was like telling myself, I was like, all right, don't get too ahead of yourself. But th that was the most confident I felt for a fight since the Zuniga fight on tough. And it played out like that. And the only thing that was different from the Zuniga fight to now was I won that inner fight with myself in the moment. Like you do hit hard, just throw it some power because mm -hmm. I spar super light, you know, ask anybody I spar with, they'll tell you Joe doesn't hit hard because I just don't believe in hard sparring. I never have. And I just, I don't have that switch when I'm sparring. A guy could be beating the shit out of me and I'll line him up for a perfect shot and I'll pull it at the very last second. I just, I can't pull the trigger in sparring. So I just don't spar hard. So guys will tell you, I hit with pillow fists, but you watch some of my fights, you can see a couple glimpses of me rocking guys. I promise you, I'm throwing those at like 40%. And, you know, I, I sat down with my coaches and they were like, just throw to kill him. You will hurt him. And in the moment come fight night, I was in there throwing to hurt him. And you could see it. The first left hand out the gate, he was already doing the chicken dance. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a fun night. <laughs> yeah, that's usually what happens. You get hit with that left hand and then they're like, oh, shit. And then, yeah, <laughs> you know, all the technique goes sure. out the window. <laughs> yeah, once his legs buckled a little bit, I was like, oh, okay, that was only like 40%. Wait till we pick this up a little bit. And more and more, you see his knees buckle. And, and I rewatched it a little, and the commentary keeps saying he's tired, he's tired, which he was, but he was rocked for a good majority of that fight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was interested. I was sort of interested in his approach to seeing you have so many submissions on your record, just too much to even count. And <laughs> he wanted to in, in, engage that with you. And, that, and that's where I was like, okay, you might get the submission off in this fight. And well, it, it was just crazy. Like leading up to like that ending, that was just a crazy, crazy fight. So yeah, so huge, after the huge second problem. round, thank you. After the second round, I sat down on the stool. My corner came in, they gave me some water, and they were like, "Striking's great, your wrestling's great, and your grappling looks great. Just brawl a little bit less." And I was like, "That's it?" And they were like, "Yeah, everything else, just keep doing it." And I was like, "Okay." But at that point, <clears> before <throat> the second round ended, and then that, I was like, "I have to knock this dude out." I just felt yeah. so confident. And even a bunch of my fights that I've won by submission, I was beating the hell out of people on the feet and they shoot. And I'm like, all right, I guess I'll take your neck. But like that night, I was like, I know I'm brawling a little bit more than usual. I was letting him hit me a little bit so I could land a bigger shot. But I was like, I'm knocking this guy out. Did I know it was going to be with that knee? No, but I knew I was going to knock him out. Uh, okay. And you mentioned the knee here. My question, Joe, is just to, just to get a little more in depth is from a viewer's perspective, it didn't even look like the strongest knee you threw in the fight. It looked like a knee, like you're back against the cage and you just try to get him off you. 
And then, like you said, his, his leg started to buckle. He started to wobble. Did it catch you by surprise to see him drop is my question here. Yes. So exactly what you guys as fans felt and saw went through my head. I threw it just to put like just to make contact and it landed perfect. And when I say perfect, I mean, I didn't even feel it. I watched my knee like hit him in the chin, but it didn't feel like it hit him in the chin. And then he backed up and I was like, OK, I got him off me. And then he kind of buckled and fell. And I was like, what the hell just happened? And I was like, I don't know. We'll figure it out later. And I jumped on him. <laughs> and that was the Started end. Attacking him. <laughs> yeah, my coach was like, my coach was like, is that a head kick? And I was like, I think it was a knee. Like, I throw my knee, and then sometimes I'll put a kick at the end of it. So, because I've done it before, I can kind of hit you with both. I'll stand you up with a knee, and then my foot comes around the side. But my foot didn't even get a chance to make it the whole way up because he fell. So I was like, I think it was my knee that dropped him, but my foot might have hit him on the way down. I have no idea. It's probably one of those things where he was he was just so tired, and anything would have put him out. So. Yeah, hundred percent. Like between the, he wasn't rest, ready for the wrestling exchanges, and then just getting hit like that. Um, yeah. I said it before, and it wasn't the hype to fight. I really do think he underestimated me a little bit. Um, I think a lot of people did, and I think him, his corner, and everybody else watching that fight was kind of in awe. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, just I, mean, I was just looking at these numbers. I mean, you had a really low chance of even knocking him out from what people thought. Um, he they actually had him having a higher chance of knocking you out so that's crazy to me how that even yeah. came about but i, I got a yeah. big melon bro if, if somebody <laughs> knocks me out i'll tell you right now if i ever get knocked out it is going to be the most horrendous like chuck liddell era like just i'm going to be starts guarantee it because i got a big ass head knock on wood <laughs> yeah let's hope we <laughs> never <laughs> see that day though <laughs> yeah that day will hopefully never come. Yeah. Uh, but if it does, I've, I've already given my girlfriend the heads up. I go, listen, I don't think any of these dudes are knocking me out anytime soon. But if it ever does happen, it's going to be horrendous. So don't be too upset. <laughs> Part of the game. It's the hurt business, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, last yeah, question I, guess so. I have on that fight, oh, Joe, is is how much did the knees, because uh, I, I felt like in all three rounds, the knees were a constant. You kept throwing them in the clinch uh, and just a part of your striking overall. So how much did that play in your game plan? Um, a lot, kind of, not even for the game plan, but just, like I said, focusing on improving. Um, before I left for AKA, we worked a lot of knees. While I was at AKA, I mostly worked wrestling, but I worked a lot of kicks, not even a lot of knees. And then when I came home, we were back on the knees again. And then in the moment, I was like, I was landing my hands, but I just saw that opening for the knee and I just kept spamming it. You know, you find that move on Street Fighter that works and you're spamming it. That was where I was at. And I also felt like, he didn't have enough power to knock me out and I felt like he didn't have a good enough counter so I felt safe just spamming it out there and I felt no danger of him you know throwing something back over the top and that's got to be the best feeling just knowing that you, there's, there's not much of a threat there so you can kind of just be comfortable and do your own thing yeah 100 percent. and I knew that um when shit hit the fan for him he was going to try and take me down and after all the wrestling that I did there was no chance he was getting me down. Even now I've got guys talking about future matchups that are like, Oh, his wrestling, his wrestling. I'm like, I promise you somebody's wrestling is not going to be a problem for me in the future. Not yeah. with these guys. I'm training with. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so I wanted to ask you one more thing. Uh, looking back a year, what are some aspects of your game? Like say you're striking your cardio, BJJ wrestling, do you, do you think you've improved on the most? And also, what is one part of your game that you really want to improve on? I'd say the two things that I improved on the most were my strength and my wrestling. And um, I, when I decided after my, my previous fight before this one, when I told everybody, hey, I'm going to take like a year off and focus on improving, those were two of the biggest things that I wanted to focus on was my strength and my wrestling. You know, everybody always says like, oh, he's so slick. He's this, he's that. But you never really saw any just pure strength out of me. And I've been lifting like crazy, which actually made it the easiest weight cut. Um, and as far as moving forward, I just want to keep focusing on my wrestling. You know, everything is going to keep improving. But my wrestling, I think, has the most room for growth. And um, I think people are going to see certain things. You know, I'm not going to be headhunting these guys going forward. But I think you guys are going to see a couple more knockouts moving forward. And people are going to say, oh, his striking's Ooh. improved so much. It, it really hasn't, you know, it's improved. Don't get me wrong. Um, mm-hmm. But every other aspect of my game is improving so much more than my striking. And it's, it's just going to, you know, it's going to lead up to guys getting stuck on the feet with me and they're going to have to pay for it. 
Yeah, and that's that's the most dangerous part about your game is you're so well rounded, and once like your wrestling improves, like you said, that's just you know another weapon to for people to worry about. So, I'd be on the lookout for that, guys. Joe's yeah, a hundred percent. Joe gets the guys. wrestling down. <laughs> Yeah, once I get that wrestling down, you guys are screwed. <laughs> you heard it here first. Uh, Joe, if, if, if somebody's never seen you fight, well, what's, how would you describe your, your fighting style and how, what you bring to the cage to somebody, a new fan? For a new fan, I don't, even, I don't really know a word for it, but I'm coming for the finish every fight um, for multiple reasons. I'm a fan of the sport. I know what you guys want to see. I don't get paid by the hour. I want to get in and out and I want to have a cool highlight reel when I'm done with all this. I want to be able for somebody, my grandkids or my kids to go, what was it like when you fought? And I'll pull up YouTube or whatever we're using in that time and be like, just sit down and watch this kids. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how you cut promo right there. That is, that was, that was great. Joe. <laughs> that was great. Um, my next question for you is understanding how unpredictable uh, MMA is and, you know, you never really know like what's next in terms of you can get hurt at any time or an opponent can fall out or whatever the case may be. Uh, if you don't mind speaking on your timeline and like where you would hope to see the next three to five years. So fight November 6th, no opponent yet. That'll be my first title defense fight again in January. Maybe get a call up to the contender of the UFC or something after that. I've told people before, if the ultimate fighter comes back around and they're looking for welterweights, I'm going, uh, you could expect to see me there. Um, but overall the next three to five years, dominating the UFC, five years is a long time and people don't realize how active I like to stay. So if we lived in a perfect world, I stayed super active, kept winning fights. Um, you'd see me towards the top of the lightweight division in the UFC in come five years. Beautiful. That's what I like to hear. And you mentioned welterweight as well. So you're going to bounce back and forth 155, 170. Is that the plan? I would for the ultimate fighter. That's about it. I, I would go to 170 for the ultimate fighter because I would get to eat steak and cheeseburgers and just power lift while fighting. And that is fantastic for me. <laughs> That's the dream. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the UFC and, and tough. If you don't mind just speaking on your experience of when you, you attended the 2018 one. Yeah, it was a great time, man. Uh, it opened my eyes to a lot of improvements I needed to make training, cutting weight, everything. And it opened up a lot of avenues for where I'm at now, you know, before the show, did I think I was going to be training alongside Daniel Cormier and Habib? No, no shot in hell. But now that's just such a tool that's readily available to me. Um, yeah. One of the best things that ever, ever happened in my career. Everybody's like, Oh, you got screwed not getting signed after the finale. I don't care. I got some of the best things that any fighter could ever wish for from that show. Amen. Amen. And you definitely made some good connections some valuable lessons sounds like you learned. And, and at the end of the day, you went uh, three rounds with somebody else who was undefeated and, and it was a split decision really could have gone either way, depending on who was judging the fight. So there's a lot of a lot of good to take away. And uh, it's only a matter of time till we see you back up there, Joe. And uh, I guess this is probably the last question that we have for you today is uh, for me in podcasts, and I look up to guys like Joe Rogan, uh, the great Bill Simmons, Mark Marin, like guys like that. So for you in MMA, who are maybe the one to two to three fighters that either you look up to for motivation or you resemble your game after, or you, you just like to watch as a fight fan? Well, we know Anderson so, Silva. <laughs> you know, Anderson Silva's up there. You know, he was, he was the first one. He got me in the sport. Um, Steven Thompson, I develop a lot of my striking around him, which is funny to think of because everybody tells me my striking reminds them of like Nick and Nate Diaz, the way I throw my punches. Um, but if you watch my amateur fights, the only Nick and Nate Diaz I had was just walking forward, flat footed and eating punches to hit you back. And after a couple of wars as an amateur, I realized I don't want to do that shit for my whole career. And I took a year off of sparring and I just, I taught myself similar styles to Steven Thompson I just watched his fights on YouTube over and over again, highlight reels, breakdowns, mm -hmm. and took so much from his style and added it to my own. Um, so he's also one of my favorite fighters. And then one of my teammates who's an active fighter still, Johnny Cupcakes Campbell, I tell everybody all the time, he is my favorite fighter um, because he is, because I can't count on both my hands how many times people have told me, oh, that sucks. Like his career is kind of over. It's a wrap. Like, He's on a however many fight losing streak. He's too old. And, you know, then he comes back and he's like, give me the best guy you got and I'll knock you the fuck out. And he does. 
And yeah. now we've got UFC vets. We've got international fighters. We've got Bellator fighters all getting sick, getting cut, whatever they need to get to get away from him, just ducking him. Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't know who Johnny Cupcakes Campbell is, look him up. You will not be disappointed. That's my guy. Amen. Look it up if you if you've never heard the name. Look it up. I've seen a couple of his clips, man. He really really lays the smack down whenever he. He's uh, a madman. He's, yeah. he's tapped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to have him on the show uh, one day uh, if you if you could set that up for us. Oh, I got you. You guys, you think I'm fun? You'll have a blast putting that dude on the mic. <laughs> well, I hope we can do like a four way here with all with all four of us, so we can just have a good time. Hell yeah, definitely. I'll hit him up. He'd be down. Sweet, sweet. But Joe, this was a great time. It was a pleasure meeting you and speaking with you. Uh, I think the sky's the limit for you. It's been a pleasure, uh, like I just said, and and, and uh, we'll see. We'll look forward to November the 6th, you say? Yes, sir. November 6th and still. And still. And, and still, uh, of course. Tell the, tell the people where to find you, your Twitch uh, account. Twitch, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, you name it, I'm probably there. I make it all simple for you guys because my name's a pain in the ass. It's Genetti MMA. Two N's and two T's. Any social media, you can find me. Everything will be linked so you guys will be able to find him anyway. But I Joe, appreciate you guys. We appreciate you, man. Really appreciate you taking your time out of your super busy schedule, as we've heard on this podcast. So we really appreciate it, man. <laughs> definitely, definitely. We'll talk some more after I uh, defend this belt. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Look forward to that, Joe. Thanks again, man.